Hey, good morning. I'd like to go ahead and call us to order. Um, so my name is Peter Chaplin. I'm the director of the training academy here at CCTS, and I'm really glad to welcome you all to the Professional Skills Development Series. Some of you are new, so I just want to mention that this is a monthly series that um, tries to cover a lot of issues related to um, early career faculty development uh, and uh, ways of making your life run smoother as an academic uh, scientist. So uh, please keep your eye on the CCTS um, weekly digest for upcoming topics. And um, we are very open to suggestions of things you'd like to hear about. So. Uh, please don't hesitate to give us feedback. You can always contact the CCTS by just emailing cctsuab.edu and say anything you'd like in that, and it'll be directed to the right person. I'm from what you say, but it'll be directed to the right person. Um, so also, um, please uh, give us feedback on how all this is going. Everybody who attends the CCTS event gets a short survey. They take less than four minutes to fill out. They're really easy, unless there's room for you to write a several paragraphs if you're passionate, but um, it's a really easy thing, and it does give all of us, including speaker feedback, on what things worked well and what things didn't work well, so please don't hesitate to do that. We're really pleased to welcome with us this morning uh, colleagues from the CCTS Partner Network. We have people from Auburn, from South Alabama, from Tulane, from the University of Mississippi. I didn't have to get to scan the whole list, but a quite a substantial group of people. I'm asking the off-site people to please mute your microphones unless you're ready to ask a question. Um, Dr. Allison has said that he's happy to take questions as we're going along, so please don't hesitate to put your hand up and um, he'll acknowledge you. And um, the off-site people, it's okay to turn your microphone on and try to break in at a particular time, but we may have to mute you if we have too much background noise, so um, it's better if you can control your own background noise so that doesn't have to happen. So, okay, we'll get on to this morning's presentation. So, Dr. Allison is known to probably most of you here, but in case not, um, he's one of UAB's most distinguished investigators. He got his early career was in the Northeast. He got his PhD at Hofstra University, uh, did a postdoc at Johns Hopkins. He's been interested in obesity research for, I think, his whole career. He came to uh, NYU. Uh, no, sorry. Columbia. New York. Uh, came back to New York. I'm not sure. Columbia. Institution. Columbia. Uh, to work in an obesity research center for a second postdoc, uh, continued his career there for um, until 2001 when he came to UAB. And he's now a distinguished professor in the School of Public Health. He's the uh, associate dean for research. He directs the uh, Office of Energetics and the uh, Nutrition Obesity Research Center. And uh, I think one of the things that's most relevant for today is that he's been an incredible advocate for approaches to help people be more successful in writing grant applications. Um, some of you will know about the very successful um, uh, Big One program, which uh, he was really the uh, pioneer for and the spokesperson for, that uh, is a model that we aren't, I guess the university isn't supporting financially at the moment, but that is uh, something that people can try to replicate many of the elements in their own lives, uh, and if there's enough feedback from the community about the value of that kind of approach, I'm sure the university will be open to revisiting whether that's something that ought to be supported. So I offer you to uh, encourage you to engage in your own best interests going forward. Uh, if there are things you know that you need to make you more successful as grant writers and scientists in any way, speak up about it. And you have a lot of power as a group, and the CCTS is here to help you exercise that power. Um, so please don't hesitate to use us to help you succeed. Thanks very much, David. Thank you, David. I very much appreciate the kind introduction and the opportunity to be here with you today. Um, as you heard and as you can see here, I'm going to talk about an introduction to grant writing. Grant writing, grant application writing, is a big topic. There's no way it could be covered in one lecture. Um, there are many different opinions about it. A lot of what I'm going to give to you today is opinion. It's my opinion. Um, take it with a grain of salt. Um, there are different ways of thinking about things. And so these are just sort of my personal scattered views about this topic. OK. There we go. Um, I want to thank several people who I will along the way, but particularly Dr. Anarina Murillo, who's here in the audience, and Dr. Cynthia Kroger, who helped me prepare this slide set. 
I'm going to assume that most of the people in this room and perhaps also off-site are relatively early in their careers. And so I'll just briefly mention that there are many agencies to which you may, may wish to write grant applications. This is uh, by no means an exhaustive list. These are examples. The one on top, NIH, is one that at least here at UAB we have the most experience and involvement with. It is one that has uh, some of the most money for extramural investigator initiated grants, but I wouldn't rule these others out. One of the things that I think on our campus we see, many of us see as an opportunity and an important one is to broaden our base of support. So to not be all NIH supported, but to get more support from NSF, USDA, PCORI, HRQ, DOD, and so on. And in recent years, as a community, we've had some success with that uh, in each of those agencies. Much of what I'm going to say will be very NIH-centric. Much will also apply to other organizations, but it comes from the perspective of someone who's thinking most about applying to NIH. These are some of the mechanisms that you can apply for at NIH. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. This is uh, a list of the more common ones. The F awards are fellowship awards. There are diversity supplements. There are K awards, and there are multiple different Ks. There's the R03, the small grant, the R21, the exploratory grant, and the R01, the main research grant. SBIR are business grants, and there are still others, T32s, P30s, and so forth. Each one has a different ethos and a different approach. I'm going to talk a little about the K series, given that many of you um, here in the CCTS, one of those Cs is for clinical. Uh, you're interested in clinical science in many ways. You're often early in your career. And so many people jump to the K award for that. K award is to support senior postdoctoral fellows or faculty level candidates in most cases, to promote career development, the transition to independent researchers, competitive for, make them competitive for future major grant support. There are many different types of K awards. They're listed in an appendix to these slides. The slides are available. Just drop me an email and we'll make them available. Um, there are three annual dates here. Now, many people think the K Award is the go-to grant for the early career investigator interested in biomedical or behavioral science related to health. And I think that it's important to realize that there are side effects of getting a K Award. Side effects may include K-phoria. And this, is, uh, this little statement is thanks to my friend Ken Sag, who is the you know, first person I heard this phrase from. And the idea is that you get your K Award, and then you say, thank God. I've now got five years of support. They can't fire me or won't fire me for five years. This is going to pay 75% or more of my effort, so I don't need to worry about getting lots of other grants during that time. So I'm going to sort of chill a little bit. And I'm going to do my work. And in about three years or so, I'll start thinking about writing my R01, which really means You'll start thinking about it then, but you'll probably slowly get up to actually working on it in your fourth year. And you say, I should really write my R01 now. You know, I'm in my fourth year. No, you should have written it at least a year ago. And that stems from that K-phoria, that sort of getting through relaxation. A very large proportion of people who get K awards don't actually go on to be all that successful in academic careers as judged by things particularly like getting R01s as PIs. So think about it. The problem is it sort of maybe lulls you into that lotus-like sleep a little too much, and it doesn't give you a lot to work with. So it ties up your time, makes you comfortable, but it doesn't give you a lot of research money. And so it may not lead to that much productivity. So it's tempting because it's perceived to be easier to get, but you may be trapped in a gilded cage of a small research program for five years that may not advance your career all that much. There's also a perception that a K award is easier to get than, an, uh, let's say, an R01. And in many cases, that is true. You'll be held to a slightly lesser standard in some ways. But not always. The funding levels are not always much higher. And it's actually a harder grant to write in some ways. Because in an R01, you're basically going to be judged mainly by the research, a little bit by you as a candidate, a very little bit by the institution, and that's about it. Whereas in a K award, it's you as a candidate is very important. The research is very important. The mentors and the mentoring plan are very important. The environment is very important. 
and the training plan is very important. So you've got five big pieces. If any one of them is seen as weak, the grant fails. R01, just write the research well. So in fact, sometimes the R01 is easier to write. It's got less moving parts. You can sometimes, depending upon what you're writing, pull it together more quickly than you can a K award because you don't have to get as many people on board. All right? K award may also make you seem as though you need mentoring. So if your tenure packet comes up for review and somebody says, okay, she's uh, three and a half years into this K award, she's got some publications, looks good, mm -hmm. um, should we promote her to associate professor with tenure? Someone says, well, wait a minute, isn't this a mentored K award? Doesn't it say she needs mentoring and that's what she wrote in the application and that's why she needed five years? She wasn't ready to be independent, right? So if we believe her, if she was honest when she wrote that application, or he was honest, then doesn't that mean this person's not an independent scientist yet? And so why should we be promoting them to associate professor with tenure? So lots of things you may want to think about with the K Award. I don't think it's as a wonderful an award as everybody thinks. Doesn't mean it's not good for some people. Doesn't mean it's never good. I just want you to not always think that it is the default. It is the one to go for first in all cases. <coughs> Excuse me. The R series is listed here. <coughs> there are many different kinds of R's. I'm not going to go through them all. The R01 is your main go-to research grant. It is your sort of regular research grant that gives you the flexibility to write just about anything you want to write. That is a research proposal. The rest are here. You can look them up yourselves. <coughs> With respect to the eligibility for awards, the K series, with the exception of the K99 or the K00 or the K99 slash R00, one must be a U.S. citizen or permanent resident to apply for the K series grant. One does not need to be a U.S. citizen or permanent resident to apply for the K99. For research, clinical, and health professional uh, R series, important to recognize U.S. citizenship or permanent residency is not required to write an R01 or an R03 or an R21 as a PI. It's a common misconception. <coughs> and by the way, another common misconception is that you need to be a faculty member to apply for an R series grant. Also not true. Um, the NIH says to apply for an R series grant, you need to be qualified and at an institution. That's it. It's qualified. There's no title required. UAB's policy, which you can find on our website, says anybody with a status 3 or status 4 as an employee is eligible if an appropriate chairperson will sign off. So you can have the title scientist, research assistant, associate, professor, janitor. It's okay. As long as you've got a department chair who's willing to sign off and you're an 03 or 04 employee, you can be the PI of a grant. All right, a few tips about grant writing. So I went to a number of K Award, recent K Award winners uh, here at UAB, and I asked them, what tips would you give people? And sort of distilled this a little bit, and thanks again to Anna Rina for helping with this. One is get organized. There are many components to the K Award. As I said, lots of moving parts, so it requires time. Communicate with program officer in advance, and I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. Begin the project four to six months in advance. Uh, I would generalize this to say just begin it far in advance. How far is far enough It's probably a little bit personal for you, but uh, four to six months is probably quite reasonable. Clearly communicate with mentors in your team about what you're planning, what they're thinking, and so on. Request references letters well in advance. This is adapted from Jessica Merlin, who's the chair of the UAB Department of Medicine Peer Mentoring Committee. She suggests establishing PubMed automated searches so that you're always getting updates on your topic of interest. Search NIH Reporter for similar grants so you can argue that yours is novel and see what others are doing and how they're pitching it. Sign up for NIH newsletters by institute. Obtain ERA Commons log login. That's going to be necessary for you to submit your grant. You might as well have it and get out of the way. Discuss literature search strategies with a librarian. Obtain examples of funding grants. If you look at the CCTS website, you'll see here that we have a, a library of those for you. Program officer. So talk to the program officer early on. 
I cannot emphasize this enough for anybody, including senior scientists, but especially early career scientists. Talk to POs from multiple institutes of interest. So I've had situations, for example, where I've gone to one institute and I've said, I have this R01 I'd like to submit. What do you think? And they may say, mm, maybe, not quite sure it's in our ballywick, not sure we would fund it even if it got a good score. I've had other institutes say, we want that one. That's ours. Get it to us, David. So, well, that one you want to make sure you get over there. You don't know until you make the call or send the email. Discuss the specific aims. In my experience, program officers, the more you come prepared to the call, the more happy they are to talk with you and the more respectful they are of you and the more helpful they are to you. So if you call and say, I'm thinking about writing a grant, something to do with obesity and disparities, can you help me? It doesn't go over so well. But if you say, I'm looking at this RFA or FOA, I'm thinking of a grant, my tentative title is this, I'm thinking it might have these specific aims. What do you think about that? Um, let's see if I can fix that here. Yes. All right. Now can I make it go away? There we go. All right. So they tend to like more specific sort of requests. Uh, they like to see that you've done your homework. You don't have to give them a full application to review. You don't even have to give them a full, beautiful, specific aims page, but at least maybe a title or an abstract or a list of specific aims themselves without the whole beautiful page with the preamble and everything. Be sure to ask them questions. The, my favorite question, and I think probably the most important question you can ask a program officer when you call, is at the end of the call say, is there anything else I didn't think to ask that you would like to tell me? And you would be amazed at some of the good information that comes from that question. People will say, well, you didn't ask, but now that you have asked that, let me tell you that, in fact, if you don't get your application in by this date, you're going to miss this important opportunity. Or that, in fact, things that come in with budgets that look like this never do well, or whatever it is. So ask that question. You get a lot of valuable information. Stay in touch with the program officer. Uh, rapport is very important. It's always important. The more your grant turns out to be on the cusp of funding, it becomes more important. So if the pay line is the 13th percentile and your grant scores at the 14th percentile, a good rapport with the program officer may help put that over the edge. That's even more to the point when you deal with F32s and F31s and K awards, where it's often the program officer will for a relatively small amount of money, try to come to the rescue of what they see as an exciting young investigator who they've got a good rapport with. The most important thing I want to say about talking to the program officer is this is vital for anything other than an R01. So an R01, as I said, that's your go-to, your standard research grant. The R01 is handled almost exactly the same way by almost every institute within NIH time after time, very clear rules, very consistent, easy to get along with. If you're a senior and experienced investigator, even though I still think it's a good idea to call the program officer, for a kind of standard R01, you can probably get away with it at times if you know what you're doing and just go. But anything other than an R01, the earth will sometimes move under your feet. If you are writing a K award, a F award, a T32, a P award, Anything like that. Every institute handles them differently, even within divisions within institutes. So NIDDK doesn't necessarily handle them the same way as NHLBI or the same way as NIA or so on. Mentoring team. Uh, this is adapted from April Carson and Julie Locker, also both K Award recipients here at UAB. One is when you pick your mentoring team, make sure you get an established mentoring record and particularly a mentoring team, if at all possible, with an established grant record. It may not be fair, it may not be nice, but the people that get on these grant review committees often are people who are themselves established, well-funded people, and they often look as the sine qua non for have you made it, as do you have PI funding from the NIH. Now, there'll be some exceptions, for example, in the field of statistics. Statisticians are less often PIs of their own R01s than are perhaps other investigators, so they may cut a break for a 
statistical mentor, but they can be very rough on this. And so we've had situations where what we think are some of our strongest, best faculty go in as mentors, and the review committee just tears them up. So you got to think about it. You may know this mentor. You may think they're great. They may be great. But do they have that established record of publications and even more so NIH grants as a PI? Doesn't mean it won't fly if they don't, but it means you've now got a hurdle to cross over. So all other things being equal, get those folks. Um, you can have a mentoring team, and most people do, and so you can balance that out by having the junior person and then the more senior person as part of your mentoring team. Make sure you've got appropriate expertise in project topic. That's sort of obvious. Make sure your mentors are accessible. More and more, they're moving to the mentoring team. The idea of the mentoring being what it was 20 years ago or more of, I work with Dr. X. Dr. X is a superstar. Dr. X has all these publications. Everybody knows Dr. X. That's it. That's my mentoring team. I work with the great Dr. X in his or her lab. Doesn't cut it anymore. They want, want process. They want teams. They want demonstration of commitment. They want a description of how often you're meeting with your mentors. They want to know it's believable, so on. For each mentor, distinguish the role in the project and training. Highlight that mentor's success in research and mentoring. And most importantly, work with people you enjoy and respect. Reference letters are key considerations in funding decisions. These again for K awards. This is from Dr. Jaren Yarar, who's just gotten an outstanding score um, for her K award. Uh, request letters early. Everyone's busy. You probably need to offer to draft the initial version. Not everybody will accept that offer, but it is necessary. And then it's, it's cost always awkward. You've got to sort of pump yourself up enough to sound good in the letter, but you don't want to go crazy and then offend the mentor. So, you know, you just have to walk that fine line as best you can. Um, the letters need to reflect the research proposal, that the mentor is familiar with it, that they're familiar with and supportive of the career goals and development plan, and that they have past training success themselves. All right, let's get into writing K and R proposals a little bit. What about the research content? Um, this is from Norm Braveman, who's a retired NIH scientific review administrator. He's often a consultant to us here at UAB and at other universities on grant writing. He uses something called a protocol, and if you're interested, we can put you in touch with him, and you can try his method if you want. He says, use that protocol, directly address each component. So he sort of gives you an outline of how to go about it. Don't present information that reviewers are not instructed to assess. Don't assume previous knowledge of reviewers. Uh, use headings and subheadings to direct reviewers. Present a testable hypothesis versus a general objective. All right, so a specific aim like, my goal is to understand the causal mechanisms of rheumatoid arthritis. What does that mean? How will you know when you understood it? My goal is to test the hypothesis that the product of this gene has a causal influence on cell, cellular inflammation among people with rheumatoid arthritis. That's a testable hypothesis. Writing for an audience, this is from Dr. Paula Chandler Laney, also a K Award recipient. The research question should be compelling, applicable, and feasible. We'll talk a little bit more about that in details. Write from the perspective of what is needed for the field and demonstrate you're fully equipped to uh, address the question. Organization visuals from Julie Locker and Aaron Phobian, again, K Award recipients. Uh, use tables, figures, logic models, organize the main points, outline things, visualize everything, make a good timeline, include one graphic per page. I don't know if it's an exact rule of one graph, but include some graphics. And as we'll get to, your reviewers want to be refreshed. They need to be freshened. Otherwise, they're not going to really, their eyes are just going to glaze over if you've got 13 pages of single-spaced text with nothing to break it up. Create your own narrative. As again, we'll talk about that. Acknowledge the limitations of your studies. No study is perfect. The reviewers understand that. And there's that old phrase, if you can't get rid of it, at least be aware of it. So acknowledge the limitation. If possible, say how you're going to minimize it, address it, but at least be aware of it. Show you've thought through the issues. When you get to writing the training plan, convey a strong training plan. Explain why that training is needed. Right? If you've been a postdoc for four years and an assistant professor for two years, 
and you got a PhD before that, how much more training do you need? Now, maybe you do, right? Maybe Matthew Loop, who's trained in biostatistics, wants to study uh, isotope dilution methods and come up with a new mathematical model for predicting something with isotope dilution methods, and he needs to study physics. Maybe. He needs to explain that then, all right? But if he's just going to be a professor of biostatistics and he says, I need more training, how much more training do you need? Um, how independence will be achieved? How will this grant help you get to your future goals? Preliminary data. So I've made this slide dark, with the phrase, don't be afraid of the dark. In my experience, preliminary data seems to be this boogeyman that frightens many investigators, especially young investigators, from getting that grant submitted. So I can't submit my grant now because I don't have enough preliminary data. I need more pilot grants and, and more time and so I'll get more preliminary data. Now, sometimes it's true, okay? So if, for example, you would like to write a grant proposal to use a particular measurement in mice, that's a new way of measuring something in the blood of mice that no one's ever done before, including you, that you suggest will work, and the entire grant is dependent upon this thing working, you need some preliminary data. Because if you can't show that this new method that you're saying your grant is dependent upon will work, why would anybody believe you're going to do it? And it may not work. You definitely need preliminary data in that situation. But now let's suppose that somebody else says, I'm going to do a study of this particular dietary manipulation on weight loss. And there's a good rationale for why that dietary manipulation might be worthy of study. How much preliminary data do you need? Well, it depends, again, on a little bit exactly what you want to do and who you are and who you're working with. But I might argue, suppose that you're a mentor working with me. What do you need to show people? That we can give diets? We've done that many times. So you have collaborators. I can say, we've done many clinical trials. We know how to give people food. We know how to recommend diets. We know how to recruit subjects. We know how to measure their weight at the end. What else do we need to show? We've shown pretty much what we need to show. And so think about as a reviewer, what would you want to know about preliminary data? Don't just think, I must have a little microcosm of my study done. Whatever my study is, I must have, you know, if I'm going to pr propose 100 mice in this condition, I need to have 10 mice done. If I'm going to propose 1,000 human subjects in this trial, I need to have done the trial with 10 subjects. Not necessarily. Ask yourself, as a reviewer, what would you want to know? I would want to know, can this person do this study? Is the hypothesis plausible? Will the methods work? That's what you need to show me. If you have enough preliminary data to show that, or you can make that case without preliminary data, fine. If you can't, then you need preliminary data. Yes? Do you think that's the case for an R as well as Absolutely. So I think it just goes back to saying that, what would that reviewer want to know? And again, I think what they're going to want to know is, you have the ability to do it. The particular methods you're proposing can plausibly do it. And it makes sense to do it. And you need to convince them of that. And sometimes it takes preliminary data to convince them of that. And sometimes it doesn't. All right. You notice there's no more preliminary data section in the NIH grant proposal. They just say, if you need it, add it where you think it goes. When we reviewed the, I, I went and reviewed about, I don't know, 50 or more pink sheets, reviews from NIH grants from the School of Public Health that either got funded or didn't get funded. And what we tried to look was preliminary data, something people routinely got criticized for. And occasionally people did get criticized for not having enough preliminary data. I've gotten it in some of my grants at times, no question. Um, but not always, even if they didn't have a lot. What's often the case is they will get criticized for the preliminary data they include if it's weak. So if you include preliminary data, make sure it's rock solid. So I think that's very important. All right. This is perhaps one of the most important slides I can show you. Um, I would argue that this is your prototypical NIH reviewer. So I want you to think of that NIH reviewer. This is somebody who is over 50 who may not be up on the latest thing that you've done, right? Your latest new technique may be new to him or her. They're a good scientist, but they're not necessarily an expert in your area. They're tremendously overworked. They stayed up late reading some of the proposals, didn't get to all of them before the meeting, read your proposal on the plane 
while having a couple of drinks and after the flight attendant rejected their flirtations. All right, so that is the mindset of the reviewer going in to read your review. Okay? This is not the person who's sort of carefully turning every page, reading every word and said, ah, what a thoughtful use of the comma. I'm glad here <laughs> she spent 15 minutes at 3 o'clock in the morning the night before it was due deciding if it was a comma or a semicolon. What they're saying is, does this excite me? Is this interesting? Do I get it? Right. As a reviewer, basically in the first five minutes, I've made a decision. Probably doesn't even take that long. I've made a decision. Either this grant, I'm not interested in funding it, I'm going to kill it, or I might be interested, now I'm going to read much more carefully. If you haven't got me in the first five minutes, the game is over. Right, I'm going to look at that title, that abstract, maybe the specific aims. And if I say, boring, been there, done that, don't care, not probative, done. Okay. If I say, interesting, cool, could help us learn something really important, now I'm going to really dig in and I'm going to say, what's their method? Will it work? How's it going to happen? So make it easy. Get them excited about it. Put in strong, specific aims. Clear statements of problems. Build incrementally to the argument so that at the end of your significance section, there's only one conclusion possible. Fund this grant application. Right. Now, this doesn't always work. Everybody's got a different style. Sometimes when I write my specific aims, I like to go through what I would call a propositional argument. And I just say it up front. I say, in the remainder of this section, I'm going to advance the following nine propositions. And I will then show evidence that each of those propositions is true. Given that they're true, I will argue that this research needs to be done. And then I say, obesity is a major problem. One, that's easy. Two, current solutions are inadequate. That's easy. Three, there is reason to speculate that X may be helpful. Okay, now I've got to build my case. X may be helpful. Four, we have a way of implementing X, and so on. And I say, given that propositions one through eight or one through nine or whatever it is are true, we need to do this research. So build them up, get them to do that. Connect the ideas together like a story. People like stories, and we'll talk more about that. What reviewers look for, this comes from Chad Steele, Assistant Dean for Research Administration here at UAB. Um, I think you can read this yourself. I'm not going to read it all to you, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, NIH peer review process, again, very straightforward. I'm going to let you read. I'm not going to go through every slide in this deck, because I think some of them are things you can read for yourself. This one I want to talk about a little bit. These are two great books about writing. All right. The one on the left is an old book. It's a very opinionated book about writing style. You don't have to agree with all of it, but it's a useful book, and it talk, it's by Strunk and White. Anybody know who E.B. White was, what he wrote? Real? Charlotte's Web, right? So very good writers, and probably the most uh, important thing they say in that book is eliminate unnecessary words. So um, the phrase, in the proposed research, it's probably one you can eliminate from your grant. And it tends to be in grants a lot, takes up a lot of space, repeat it over and over, you can probably get rid of that. There are other unnecessary words sometimes that may not be so obvious. One is the word novel. The word novel is one of the most overused words in the field of science. You see it over and over again in people's papers, in their abstracts, and in their grant proposals. In this novel proposal, I propose a novel method to test the novel hypothesis that, you know, if it's so bloody novel, I'll figure it out. Right? So let the idea convey it. Let the good writing convey it. I review often for the last few years for the so-called Pioneer Awards, which are really meant to be very novel, cutting-edge stuff from pioneers. And people write these little essays. And one guy, he actually had a decent idea, but the proposal was just screaming at me over and over. So this, everything was bolded and underlined. In this paradigm-breaking shift, this novel thing, Dr. X has a history of breaking paradigms three times in his career. And it's like, oh, come on, just give me a break. Tell me your idea and let the idea speak for itself. So you need to explain that things are novel, but yelling 
bolding, underlining, and calling it novel or paradigm breaking or innovative doesn't do it. Explain why it's novel. So if you say a common belief is X causes Y, it is generally accepted that X causes Y as, for example, in this quotation from the standard textbook of our field. In contrast, I believe that Y causes X. I believe that if we can demonstrate that Y causes X and that X doesn't cause Y, it totally changes the way we will deliver preventive care for this thing. You don't need to say it's novel. You just laid it out. There it is, QED. The one on the right is a different aspect of writing. It's about storytelling. One of the things that has been found over and over in research is people who are successful at conveying their ideas, and particularly people who get their ideas to remain with others, use stories. When you look at speakers, so people did a study, they had a whole bunch of student speakers come up one after another, give short talks. Then afterwards, they said to the audience, could you write down some things you remember from the talks? And they looked, what, what related to whether or not people remembered elements of a talk? Was it whether the speaker was a native English speaker? No. Was it whether the speaker was especially funny? No. Was it whether they're especially smooth? No. It was if they used stories. Stories work. Right, so people remember stories. That's why newspapers tend to be focused on that instead of a very careful analysis of all the facts in the presidential campaign. Right, it's not what you get. What you get is he said, she said. Good guy, bad guy. Right? Because people like the human element. They like the story. That's what sticks in their mind. That's what we're sort of built to attend to. So give people a story. Now, you don't want to go and sort of write your grant proposal like a, a TV news you know, analysis of a presidential campaign, but you want to work through a story. Elements of stories that create that interest, remember I said you've got to capture that person's interest, is the idea of uncertainty. So tune in next week, same bat time, same bat channel, right? Anybody old enough to remember that? Right, Batman, right? And when if you were a kid in the 1960s, you know, Batman came on and then the Riddler would have them all tied up. What's gonna happen to Batman? And then they say, Tune in next week, same bad time, same bad channel, creates uncertainty, information gap. So if you can say, for years, people have wondered why X and Y are associated. To this day, it remains a mystery. Despite our efforts, we have not figured this out. We know that it's not this, this, or this, but the causal factors remain unclear. Subsequently, I will address this. Now you can say, Obesity is a big problem, blah, 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 blah. Hey, you've just created an information gap. I said, just tune in later. Same bat time, same bat channel. I'm going to tell you what the reason for this mystery is. So you want to create that sort of sense of excitement of a story. Read this book, Made to Stick. I once read, they had a little section in it. It was from a thing from Ohio State had put on their website. It was about how to tell people to use sunscreen to protect against melanoma. And I read it. I thought it was very well written. I thought, that's just how I would have written it. It was clear. It was concise, reasonably concise. It was straightforward. It laid out the facts. Okay? Then these writers rewrote it as they would write it. And I said, oh, now I get it. That's well written. I wrote it like a boring egghead scientist. They kept the facts. They didn't dumb it down, but they turned around what was interesting. So instead of seven lines of describing different kinds of radiation and what ultraviolet radiation is and so on and what a melanoma is and eventually working it way up and saying in the end essentially exposure to the sun um, affects your skin like the process of aging, they said, sentence one, exposure to the sun ages your skin just like the process of aging. Oh, okay, here we are, I get it. I know it's important. I didn't have to get eight lines in to decide what was important. So, great book. This is a little tip I got from uh, Victor Darley Usmar here at UAB. When your grant is close to ready to go, not only should you proofread it again and again and again, but read it out loud. Victor says he will never let a manuscript or a grant proposal leave his lab until at least one person has read it out loud to at least one other person. And when he first told me about this, really out loud, why, you know, he said, you'll just catch things you won't otherwise catch. And I've tried it. It's very painful. It's slow. 
it's hard to stand there and read out loud every footnote and so on, but you will catch things that you will just never catch otherwise. It's an incredibly valuable technique. Revise, revise, and revise. Obtain feedback. Organize your arguments linearly. Uh, include only essential words and concepts. This is from Jan Clementides, formerly of UAB and a K Award recipient. Important thing, I think, is that you're never ready. You know, you often hear people talk about this with marriage. They talk about with having a baby. I don't know. Is this a good time? No, it's not a good time. It's never a good time to get married or have a baby. It's always inconvenient. But if you want to do it, you just got to pick a time and do it. So if it's important to you, pick a time and do it. If writing your grant proposal is important to you, pick a time and do it. There's always more preliminary data you could get. There's always going to be a time when you're less busy or when you think you'll be less busy. It's never a convenient time. Just do it. In the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. This is an interesting idea. Um, often people may think that either they're not terribly expert in something or that their idea is not enormously novel or important. And you have to realize that in some senses that's often context specific. And I'll give you one example. So uh, I had a former postdoc who had studied obesity and mortality with me. He then went on to an injury research center where he's studying vehicle crashes and mortality. So he starts studying in epidemiologic data the correlation of obesity with death after a uh, vehicle crash. Gets a few papers published, says to me he wants to write an R01. I said, you know, I know these guys over here in the School of Engineering at UAB. They have these fancy methods where in silico, in computers, they crash vehicles into walls and things and see what happens with, based on principles of physics and engineering. Maybe we can talk to them. So we did. We got some of them together, submitted proposals. We got an R01 funded. This guy got his R01, his first R01 out of it. And then one of the engineering professors picked it up and wrote an R21, nailed it on the first try. Got it. Now, if you take those engineering methods they were using and you show them to a top-notch engineering professor, they'll say, okay, standard stuff, no big deal. But you show it to a team of obesity researchers on study section and they say, whoa, this is cool. We never saw this before. This is really impressive. And so you've got to think about that a little bit. There are sometimes ways to find novelty that aren't, don't come from having to create something from whole cloth, but from borrowing from one field and bring it to another field. In this light, it's important to realize that it's not what you don't know, but it's who you know. So for example, if I want to write a grant proposal on the relation between some aspect of dentistry and uh, obesity, I have no track record in dentistry and I don't know a lot about dentistry and I might not be credible, but I could call Dr. McDougal from the School of Dentistry and I could ask her to be a collaborator and suddenly all of her knowledge and expertise and data she's collected over the years become part of my research team for that proposal and now I may be successful. So again, think about that for any gap you have. You don't want to leave any gap uncovered. If you're going in, you want to make sure that every bit of expertise you need to execute that grant proposal is covered. And if you don't have it and your team doesn't immediately have it, get someone else. One of the nice things about being at a relatively big university like UAB is we have an expert in the vast majority of things somewhere on campus. Get that expert. If we don't have it here, go outside. Don't be afraid to call Dr. Big. Dr. Big is probably, you know, not quite as famous as, uh, you know, Bruce Springsteen and probably doesn't get stopped for his or her autograph all the time in the airport, Dr. Big will be delighted to get your phone call and potentially work with you. Some of my successful grants have been just exactly from that. I sent an email as a young investigator to somebody I didn't know who was the world's top person at another university on something, and I said, would you be willing to help me? Uh, I'd like to write a grant on this. I know this, but I don't have a track record in that. Would you be a consultant or a collaborator? And most of the time they're flattered. Most of the time they agree, and suddenly you have a respectable research team. Uh, I asked Jay Zhang, who's the chair of mechanical engineering here at UAB, and very successful getting R01s, how might you think about getting your second R01? And how might you think about going beyond R01s to PO1s and things like that? And he said, big thing is consider going outside your lab or institution to establish collaborations with other leaders in your field. And again, I think that's very effective. Put together that dream team. 
Get the best in the world at what you're interested in, and then go for the big targets. A few myths. You know, one is uh, general principles. Don't learn the rules of grants by asking folks whose knowledge derives from hearsay. So there's a lot of things, there's a lot of myths out there. And I, I've perpetrated some myself. I've occasionally caught myself where I'm saying to people, you're not allowed to do this, you must do this, only to carefully go back and check the rules later and find I was wrong. So hopefully I'm not perpetrating too many today. By all means, check me. But when you talk to your colleague down the hall, the next postdoc, the next assistant professor, even your department chair, even your department business officer, don't assume that what they think is a rule is in fact a rule. They may be right, can't hurt to check. Say, can you show me, look up the policy, and so on. And here's a couple of examples. One, this is not so much a rule, but a principle or an idea that the R21 is a good training wheels grant for young investigators. This is one of my real pet peeves. I am not saying that no one should ever write an R21. I am not even saying that no young investigator or early career investigator should ever write an R21. But I think the R21 is often used by people as a way of overcoming the fear of the R01. So the R01 is too scary. I'll never get it. I won't be seen as competitive. So I'll go for the R21. It'll be a mini R01. R21 is not a mini R01. It is not meant to be your training wheels grant. It is not meant just to be a grant to help you get started early in your career. Originally, it was meant to be the exciting grant for the wild, crazy idea where you don't need preliminary data. Now think about that a little bit. If we have a brand new assistant professor who comes in and says, could you give me this grant for this wild, kind of crazy idea? And by the way, I don't have any preliminary data. Are you going to believe that they can do it? Maybe. Big name senior professor comes in and says, I've been successful for 20 years, time after time, showing I can do good work and innovation. I've got this new kind of wild and crazy idea. I admit it's a little wild and crazy, but I think it might work. Will you give me a little money to take a shot? Who's your better bet? Senior person, right? R21 is a grant for senior people. It's not to say you're not allowed if you're a junior person but it's a better grant for senior people. If you look at the statistics on it, you can just see some here, it's not reliably funded at higher levels than the R01. By the time, if you get the R21, if you're lucky enough to get it, the moment you get it, you better start writing that R01 because by the time you get the R01 written, submitted, resubmitted, your R21 is going to have run out. You don't get five years to think about it a little bit. Start immediately. So bottom line, I would say, with very few exceptions, the R21 is not the grant. It should be the go-to grant for the early career investigator at a research-intensive university where you are going to be expected to be significantly grant fund as a PI for much of your career. That might be different for different people. You might go to a setting where they say, you know, they don't really expect me to get grants here. If I get my summer salary covered by a grant, that's enough. It might be a different situation. An FOA is needed. You need to have a... a um, opportunity, funding opportunity announcement to apply, but it doesn't have to be a specific RFA, right? You can always just go for the parent grant. So if you're doing the R01, you can just use the parent R01 and say, I want to study uh, breastfeeding and obesity. You don't have to go find an RFA about breastfeeding and obesity. So one of the questions is, um, is it good to write to the RFA if one comes out, or is it better to just submit your grant through the ordinary mechanisms? Um, that's a judgment call. But again, I think there's a common belief that when that RFA comes out and they say, aha, we're looking for proposals on um, school-based treatments for obesity. And you say, I'd like to do a proposal on school-based treatment for obesity. That'd be great. Um, there's this RFA out now. I'm going to rush and do that. You have to think about that a little bit. Could you submit a proposal like that just as a regular R01 through the parent mechanism? Yes. What's your chance of getting funded? Well, sort of on average, 15%, let's say. All right, so that's not bad. You'll have the flexibility to do it more or less the way you want. Now, let's go back to this hypothetical RFA. Suppose they say, we plan to give two of these out. Okay, two. How many people are going to apply? If more than 20 people apply, then my chances are less than 10%. That's actually less than if I just go in the main... R01 pool. So if I think that I'm the best guy in the country to do school-based treatments for obesity and put in a proposal, 
I'll go for that. But if I think, no, there are a lot of people actually have been doing a lot more of that than me, I could do an okay proposal, but I'm not sure I'm one of the top guys in the country, I'm not sure I want to go for that RFA. So again, you just got to think about it. You got to look at how many they're going to fund, think about where you are in that hierarchy for that, think about whether it's resubmittable. If I go for the RFA and I don't make it, can I then take my proposal back and resubmit it as a regular R1? Or is this a very you know, specific RFA where if I don't make it for this one, there's nothing I'm going to be able to do with this application afterwards? So you got to think about all those things. All right, let's switch gears a little bit to creativity to get into more of the meat of this. Creativity and grant writing. This is a neat guy named Robert Sternberg. Uh, he's one of the world's leading cognitive psychologists. And he put out something a few years back called Creativity as a Decision. He wrote some papers on this. People asked him to talk about it. He, he thought about it a little bit, did some reading, and he said, you know, people seem to think that creativity is this thing that you're either born with or you're not, right? You're either Mozart, who's composing music at age four, or you're not. And he said, you know what, I don't think that's it. And he looked at the literature and it didn't seem to be it. It's not to say that there is no innate, genetic, heritable component to creativity. But it's also something that very much can be learned, and he argues it can be a decision. And part of that decision is the willingness to tolerate what you need to tolerate in order to be creative. So you need to tolerate the discomfort of having to learn new stuff, because if you're really going to do creative stuff, you've got to get outside the box, you've got to learn new stuff, you can't just follow what everybody else is doing. And you have to tolerate that people may laugh at your idea, they may not like your idea, they may think it's ridiculous. And you have to decide whether you're willing to tolerate that. One of the things that's important to realize is creativity is not hot. When we ask people for creative ideas in various sessions we do on trying to promote creativity, often what people think of is hot. So they say, I've got this really creative new idea. So, you know, the gut microbiota, that's really hot. And I study autism. And so I'm going to do autism and gut microbiota. That might be a great idea. I don't really know. Um, but it's definitely not creative. That's just, you know, a word salad, right? You just take a few words from here and a few words from here and a few words. Epigenetic, microbiota, disparity, autism. <laughs> Boom. There's my creative. No. That's hot. You're following the crowd. It's ex the exact opposite of creative. All right. We've tried to use some biguans as a way of not only helping people be creative, but of also helping them get their proposals written and hopefully written well. Iguan is a Chinese word. It means, uh, loosely translates to go stare at a, go to a monastery and stare at a wall for a while until your ideas become clear. And the way this came about is I was trying to write a program project grant about eight years ago. And I'd wanted to do it for a while, and I couldn't get myself over the sort of psychological hump to do it. Every time I started, I wasn't ready. Every time I started, I had some reason why now wasn't a good time. I found flaws in my own ideas. I just couldn't get myself to do it. And so I finally said, you know, if you want to do this, you have to just bite the bullet and do it. You have to make a commitment and do it. So I looked at my schedule for, it happened to be the month of April was coming up. And I looked at April, I said, I don't have too much travel. I canceled the travel I had. So I had, now I had no travel in the month of April. And I blocked four hours every single weekday for a month. And I said, for those four hours, I will go to another room that's not in my office. And I will not leave that room except for emergencies. And while in that room, I will not work on anything other than this grant proposal. I will not take phone calls. I will not answer emails unless they relate to this grant proposal. And so I went to some young colleagues who needed to write their R1s. And I said, I'm going to do this. And by the way, if you want to come with me, you can do it with me. And you can write your R1s. And I said, it'll be a cloistered session. And they were from China. And Chinese was their first language. And they said, what's a cloistered session? And I said, I explained what cloister meant. And they said, oh, Biguan. Oh, okay, what's Biguan? And he explained it to me. I said, good, we'll call it Biguan. That's what we'll do. So that's where that name came from. If you go to that website up there, which is by Deep Dive, there's a great um, old episode from 2020 talking about a company called uh, Ideo, which is an idea factory. And you will see how they make creativity a factory. And that seems strange. Creativity, factory. We think factory, another widget, another widget, another widget. The opposite of creativity, right? But they talk about creativity as a process. And they build on, I don't think they were aware of Sternberg's work time, but it's the same ideas of Sternberg. There are decisions you can make and processes you can put into place to be creative and do it in short order. So that's what they do. We build it on that. 
I'm not going to go through the rest of this, but we basically set up a whole week. For, we, do, we still do it within the NORC. So if you want to do an obesity proposal and you need a Biguan, you can let me know, and we'll try to set one up for you if we can. And we hire an NIH program officer to come in, spend a week with you, and we lock you in a room. We bring you lunch every day. We say, don't go anywhere. Don't go for lunch. Here's your lunch. We bring your graphics person, draws your graphics, so you don't have to think about spending time making an oval in PowerPoint. And people come out with good grants. All right. Now, what about this idea of creativity? How does this special idea come? I talked about creativity is not how. What is it? Well, I think if you really want to be creative, and I'm not suggesting you always should be creative. Sometimes it's good not to be so creative. You have to, make, you have to place your bets and hedge your bets at times. But when you do, I think what we're often looking for, and I think this is where science is often at its best, is what one might call a transcendental experience. What I mean by that is not that you go to the peyote you know, you know, you go to the sweat lodge and smoke some peyote and you come out with some new idea, but that you think about things in a different way, transcendental. You transcend your ordinary experience. So let's see if I can make this thing work. Oh, okay. Um, so this is from a book about Einstein. And it says Einstein was struggling. Um, he was trying to figure out a certain problem. And he tried to analyze it with his friend Michel Besso. But after repeatedly going over the issue, right, there's a key phrase, repeatedly going over the issue. It's not like it came to in a flash of lightning just all at once. There was a lot of thinking that had gone on. It didn't seem like it was getting anywhere, but lots of time and thought. He became exhausted. I quit. I give up. He said he's defeated. He's going to go home. When he arrived home at night, he continued to consider the dilemma. His epiphany occurred as he imagined a car driving away from the town clock tower at the speed of light. So, right, the taxi's taking him home, and he thinks, what if I were in the car driving away, and I'm looking at the town clock tower as I drive, and my car is moving at the speed of light? He said, if the car moved at the speed of light, the town's clock would appear fixed to someone in the car. The clock's light could not catch up to the streetcar, but the, clock's, the car's clock would beat normally to a person inside. So the clock inside the car looks like it's moving. The clock outside the car looks like it's standing still. Time is standing still over there. Time is moving normally in the car. The theory of relativity. Okay? So, what kind of ridiculous question is this? What if my car were moving at the speed of light? It's absurd. Cars don't move at the speed of light. They don't even get close to the speed of light. It's a ridiculous question. But by asking that ridiculous question, what if, he transcends ordinary experience. It's a transcendental moment. And suddenly he can think about things in a new way. And if you like to think about these kind of questions, there's a fun book by this physicist. He used to be a physics professor, and then he quit and became a cartoonist. Um, and he wrote this book, it's called What If, and it's scientifically um, sensible answers to absurd hypothetical questions. So he says, what if everybody in the world stood in the state of Rhode Island and jumped up all at once? Like how much would it move the earth? And then he goes through all the calculations, it wouldn't move the earth very much. Um, but this is this idea of thinking in different ways. Kids are good at this, right? and then we get not so good as we get a, to be adults. We have what's called functional fixity in our thinking. Kids are much better. And so ideas try to play with that. If you want some ideas about creativity, these are three different books that I think talk about brilliant creativity in science, different perspectives. There's actually a movie out on this now. We're trying to see if we can get a copy and have a little showing among a group of us here at UAB. Um, this is about Ramanujan famous Indian mathematician, probably as much as anybody in history, someone who really deserves that reputation of genius as qualitatively different in science and mathematics. So Ramanujan was not just like somebody like me who studied math a little harder. There was something special about Ramanujan. It wasn't just a decision. Ramanujan dropped out or failed out of college twice. He was from India. He's a vegetarian. He goes to college. They want him to also learn English. He didn't really want to do that. They tell him you have to dissect a frog. He says, I'm a vegetarian. I'm not going to dissect a frog. So he failed out of college twice. He's hanging out on the back porch of his parents. 
paper is expensive, but he manages to get a few notebooks, and he starts writing math in notebooks. And he's not really trained, so he doesn't have good notation, but he makes up his own notation. And eventually, people know he's smart, but they can't quite tell. There's no one good enough in math around him to tell, is he smart and a nut or smart and a genius? And so eventually, he sends some notebooks to G.H. Hardy, as in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, right? Everybody in genetics is sort of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. That's from G.E. Hardy. And Hardy, at the time, is the top mathematician in the world. And the second top mathematician in the world is Littlewood, who's Hardy's buddy, who's across campus. And so Hardy gets this thing. It's like a notebook from a clerk in India in some crazy notation no one's ever seen before, laying out all these theorems no one's heard of, but that are cool theorems. Hardy thinks, is this a joke? Somebody pull on my leg, because these guys like to do this to each other a lot at that time. So he goes over to Littlewood, and the two of them pour over this notebook, and they realize, it's not a joke. Some, this is real. These theorems make sense. So they start corresponding. They realize he's real. Eventually, it goes for a while. They get him to um, come to their university. And Hardy's a very formal mathematician, proves everything very clear, very organized. And he says to Ramanujan, you know, you have these theorems, but you don't have any proofs. Ramanujan says, what's a proof? So Hardy says, explains the proof. He says, how do you get it? Where did this come from? And Ramanujan said, the goddess Namagiri whispers it in my ear. And no one knew if he was joking or not. And so that was Ramanujan. It's a great story if you want to sort of read more about it. Um, brilliant, brilliant man. Clearly a genius. This is the sense of this divine inspiration. So that's one idea. I don't know, how, I don't know if there's a way to become Ramanujan. I'm not sure you'd want to. But that's the kind of creativity that's one type. This is another one. It's called Time, Memory, Time Love Memory. It's about, um, really about behavior genetics. Um, it's a brilliant story about uh, these various scientists and their commitment to um, pursuing new ideas the long hours, the willingness to tolerate being laughed at. So this is much more, I think, in line with the kind of creativity as a decision. The progenitor of this book um, at one point was one of the people who uh, invented the transistor. So this is in the 1930s. And there's big money to be had. And so these physicists and these engineers start leaving academia after that and starting companies and they're making big money and so on, and this guy says, I want to go study fruit flies. And all his buddies say, you want to do what? He says, I want to go study fruit flies. I want to understand how, you know, these genes work and stuff. And he goes, like, you're crazy. And he says, maybe, but I want to go study fruit flies. And he does it and becomes this, you know, hugely important leader of the field. In it, there are many other stories, this idea of pursuing the oddball idea, and it's that idea of bravery, creativity as a decision, long hours, see it over and over again, long hours. You hear a lot about work-life balance. There's no work-life balance. This is a myth, okay? There are work-life decisions. There are work-life choices. You decide how much you want to work. You decide how many school plays it's okay to miss for your kid and how many it's not. You decide whether you want to be the person who publishes the most papers or a good number of papers. There's no right answer. It's up to you. You decide what's the right thing for you. All right? But what I will say is if you want to be in the game of competing for NIH grants, competing for the top scientific slots, what you're competing with is guys like this, right? and they're not working for the hours a week. What you see over and over again, you see it with Ramanujan on his back porch, you see it with Einstein spending long hours in the patent office, sneaking away, thinking about his ideas. What you see is with these guys spending long hours up all night counting flies, long, long hours, choice to be creative, taking risks. Some of you have heard about centimorgans in genetics. You know what a centimorgan is, right? It's a unit of distance in genes. You know where it comes from, why it's called a centimorgan? Anybody? Thomas Hunt Morgan. So Thomas Hunt Morgan was at Columbia University at the time, and he has a student working with him, an undergraduate student named Sturdivant. And so Sturdivant and he would steal milk bottles from people's stoops, 
you know, this is a long time ago when, when the milkman would drop milk bottles, glass milk bottles off and pick the empties up. So they would go out early in the morning, they would steal the empties from people's stoops and use those to keep flies. They take these up and they start these fly colonies. One day they notice that there's this fly with white eyes. And so they say, okay, this is an interesting fly. And they notice it breeds true. So now they've got this fly with white eyes, this mutant. Then they get some other flies, funny bristles, fat abdomens, whatever it is. And they start to notice there are these mutations. They start studying them, putting them together, finding out how they breed. They knew chromosomes existed, but remember, structure of DNA hasn't been worked out yet. The idea of genes, genes are still hypothetical. People believe there's this thing we call genes, but no one's actually seen a gene. No one actually knows that genes exactly exist. And they start all this breeding, and they've got all these index cards. And these index cards lay out how these different genes are, how these different phenotypes go together, how often they recombine, how often they mix up. And Sturdivant goes home one night. He's supposed to do his homework for class. And he says, screw it. And he just throws the homework away. And he takes all these cards and he lays them out on a table. And he says, these chromosomes, they're like strings, right? So it's kind of like a linear, it's like a line. What if these things are ordered on these chromosomes, these genes that make white eyes and bristles and so on? And then the strings got broken up. And how often they get broken up would depend upon how far apart these things are. So I'll calculate the percentage of the time these things recombine or get broken up and all. And he comes back the next morning to Professor Morgan. He says, I got this thing. I think it's a map. It's the first genetic map. That's why they're called centimorgans, right? Because it came in Morgan's lab. Um, so maybe it should have been called center stirred events or something. But it was because, in part, these guys had the bravery to do these crazy things, right? Study flies and milk bottles. And because some undergraduate student spent long hours thinking of it and was willing to risk being laughed at and was willing to risk throwing his homework away to focus on this. Last one I'll talk about is this book called The Invention of Air by Stephen Johnson. And Stephen Johnson talks about the invention of air. It's really the discovery of oxygen with Joseph Priestley as being the chief discoverer of it. And Priestley wasn't super wealthy, but he had a little bit of money, had a patron. And that gave him time to work on things. So again, you see the long, long hours. The other thing you see is the idea of conversation. So in the other Birmingham, Birmingham, England, they had something called the Lunar Society. Lunar, and they called themselves lunatics because they would walk home by the light of the moon. So they'd go to somebody's house for dinner, and then after dinner they'd walk home and it'd be a full moon that night, so they'd have a little bit of light to walk home in. And the people who'd come would be people like Joseph Priestley and Ben Franklin and Darwin and so on. Um, and not Charles, his father. Um, and so these great conversations were had. And they would talk about everything from politics to philosophy to theology to science. And these conversations and these long hours working helped Priestley to understand things. He eventually started to figure out that there's in air, right? So if you take a mouse and you put it under a glass lid for a while, for a while it's okay, right? There's some air in there for it. But eventually the mouse goes out. If you put a candle under the glass lid, it goes out pretty quickly. If you put a mouse under the glass lid after the candle's been in it, the mouse goes out really quickly. Maybe the candle uses something up that's in there. If you put a plant under the glass lid and you wait a while, then you can put the mouse in and it's okay, at least for What's going on? So he brings his friend Ben Franklin over one day to show him his apparatus. And Ben Franklin is the one who understands what it is. And Ben Franklin says there's a substance in there. That's the discovery of oxygen. So this idea of conversation. So get out there, talk to people. Don't just get stuck in your lab. Talk to lots of people, talk to different people, talk to different about different things. Talk to engineers, statisticians, mathematicians, physicists. That's why you're at a university. Don't just get stuck in your lab. Talk to people, have long conversations, read, 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 think, think, think. That's where that creativity comes from. All right, it's getting late. I'm going to skip past a lot of these things here. 
just in the interest of time. This part, though, I think is a little important, which is coping with the peer rejection blues. I say jokingly, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. Actually, I am a licensed clinical psychologist. There is a license on my wall. Um, but probably none of you would want to get therapy from me. Um, but one of the things we have in the field of psychology is this thing called rationally motive behavior therapy. And rationally motive ther behavior therapy is very useful when you're dealing with grant writing because what's going to happen when you write grants is you are going to face rejection. And you are going to face rejection no matter how good you are. I don't know anybody who never gets their grants rejected. I know people who are Nobel Prize winners who have gotten their grants rejected. I know people who are distinguished professors who get their grants rejected, triaged, unscored. I get some of my grants unscored. Happens regularly. It's okay. Right? I don't like it, but I accept it. Very important. And it's important to get over that dichotomous thinking. A common thing that young people do is they submit that grant application and they say, I built myself up. It took me two years as an assistant professor to get the idea clear, to work it up, and then I submitted it, and now I wait. Well, there's two mistakes in there. One is to see that this is like the be-all and end-all. This is the grant, and now you're going to wait. Partly, you got to get going. Get the next grant in because, just you know, given the odds, you got to keep trying. The other is, this is not the be-all and end-all. So then what happens is they're waiting for the test. It comes back, and it's unscored. Oh no, okay, I have been judged. I have been weighed, I have been measured, and I have been found wanting. It's over for me. I'll just leave quietly. I'm a bad person, I'm an idiot, I'm a fool. I don't know what they thought. They gave me the PhD, I know. It was just a mistake. Now I'm finally found out. They realize I'm an imposter all along. They realize I don't really know anything. I don't have any creative ideas. I'll never make it. I'll just see if McDonald's has any openings flipping birds now. That's very dichotomous thinking. It's absolute. It's all or none. It's not that way, all right? We've all got our grants rejected. I get mine regularly rejected. I've done analysis. I skipped past it. But in the School of Public Health, and we're, depending on which year you look at, we're in the top 10 sometimes and always just about in the top 20 uh, schools of public health in the United States for grant funding. And our hit rate is about 17%. In the university overall, it's about 19%, meaning 19% of applications we submit to NIH get funded. Okay? When I look at our very best hitters, the 90th percentile of success rate in the School of Public Health, it's almost exactly double the median. It's about 34%. What does that mean? One third. So two thirds of the time, our best hitters strike out. Our full professors, the big stars, the senior ones that come and give talks like this about how to write grants, strike out two-thirds of the time. So when you strike out, it's okay. Pick yourself up, dust yourself off, come at it again. So these are some things. Don't take it too personally when you get rejected. Almost everybody gets rejected at some point. You're up against, this is an old slide, you're up against the 20th and 25th percentile, actually you're up against the 10th and 15th percentile now. Don't respond to criticisms immediately. Your first reading won't be objective. Wait a few days before digesting the comments. You've probably invested an enormous amount of time and energy in the proposal and can hardly avoid an emotional response. Um, and this is uh, uh, from this source here. So this guy says, here's his, his uh, aftermath of rejection. One day of depression, one day of utter contempt for the editor and his accomplices, one day of decrying the conspiracy against publishing the truth, one day of fretful ideas about changing my profession, and one day of reevaluating the manuscript in review of the editor's comments, followed by concluding I was lucky it wasn't accepted. So we've all gotten rejected. It's OK. Just pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and go again. Now, there's an important thing to realize here. This is a tough game. Not everybody has to play it. You know, if somebody were to say to me, you know, David, we've got this, you know, football thing going on here at UAB, and you can join the football team if you want, and we'll let you play with the other guys. And, but, you know, there's a lot of broken bones and bruises and, you know, 
neck fractures and so on. But that's it. You pick yourself up, you dust yourself off, you come at it again. If you want to play this game, you say, you know what, guys? I think I'll sit this one out. I think I'll stay over in the statistics office and you let the other, the bigger guys play the football. That's not my game. It's okay. I don't want to play. And I think that's a reasonable conclusion. Some people may say, you know what? I don't want to play a game where I strike out two-thirds of the time, even if I'm the top hitter, and where I strike out five out of six times if I'm an average hitter. I still want to play that game. I don't want to have to submit six grant applications to get one on average. That's okay. Just know what you're up against and make your decisions about where you want to work. All right. I think you can go over some of these yourself. It's just important to recognize, again, that everybody's gotten rejected. This is uh, Edward Jenner. He invented the smallpox vaccine. Um, so a little story about this, just to give you a sense of the context and the importance. So at, at this time, there are two major forces raging through Europe, smallpox and Napoleon. And Edward Jenner is a physician. And he starts to wonder something about smallpox. He notices that milkmaids, people who milk the cows, they don't get smallpox very often. And he says, you know, I wonder if that's because they get cowpox first, which is this little thing they get on their hands, infection from the cows. It's a little bit like smallpox, but kind of mild, not so bad. And he says, I wonder if because they get the cowpox first, and then that protects them against the smallpox. I think it might be true. So he writes to his mentor, who's John Hunter. Um, Hunter writes back a very famous letter. And Hunter says, why think? Do the experiment. Great line. Right? Now, there's no IRB. So he doesn't have to go to the IRB. He just gets his kid named James Phipps. And he says, kid, you know, come here. Come here. Kid comes over. And he infects the kid with smallpox, with cowpox. Excuse me, with cowpox. Kid gets a little sick recovers in a couple of days, he's fine. Then he says, kid, come here. <laughs> Infects the kid with smallpox. Kid is fine. All right. He writes this up, sends it to the journal of the Royal Society. All right. And Sir Joseph Banks, right? Sir Joseph Banks, this is the great hero. This is on Captain Cook's boats. This is the guy who was with all the Polynesian women and doing all these amazing things in his early life. But where's his spirit of adventure now? Well, maybe he didn't have so much now. And he writes back, and he says, a fellow of the society, they reject his paper. They say, a fellow of the society should be cautious and ought not to risk his reputation by presenting to the learned body anything which appears so much at variance with established knowledge and with all so incredible. So they say, this is incredible. This is crazy talk. You know, if you want to preserve your reputation, take this away. So everybody gets rejected sometimes, even the guy who invented this. So important, right? Do you know why vaccines are called vaccines? What's the Spanish word for, for cow? Vaca. Okay, vaccine, cowpox, vaca. So somebody would comment, the lancet of Jenner saved far more human lives than the sword of Napoleon destroyed. So you're in good company if you get rejected. Just get ready for it, and it's okay. This is Pasteur, the great cowboy of science, one of the bravest, most exciting men in science. Somebody asked him, what's the secret of your success? And he could have said, I'm smarter than everybody else, but he didn't. What he said is, let me tell you the secret that has led me to my goal. My strength lies solely in my tenacity. So I think that is a great note to end on, and I hope I'll see all of you out for a hike one day. Thank you. We have just about two or three minutes if anybody has any last questions. Yes, Mary? Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, you mentioned that um, one just has to have a professional degree in order to um, submit an NIH grant. You don't need to have a professional degree. Uh, you don't need to have graduated high school. Okay. Don't even have to have high school. But there is an inherent bias with the reviewers on academic appointment level. That is true. So have you spoken with the School of Public Health with um, people with different titles to see if, in fact, um, without a faculty title, like a research associate, people have been successful here at UAB? 
I, there are certainly cases of people that have been successful, but I don't think we have enough sample size to answer it in any sort of real empirical way. But I agree with you. There is a bias. I think when people come in with a title other than something like professor or research scientist, um, there will be a bias against them. Any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those are good ideas. If you look at who gets the Pioneer Awards and the Transformative R01s and those sort of sort of high-end innovation kind of grants, in my experience, they tend to be much more focused on how things work as opposed to treatment of things. So you don't see a lot of things like blah, 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 diabetes, blah, 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 obesity. You see things like blah, 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 how cells work. Um, when you do see a disease, it's, in my view, more often cancer than anything else. And it's really just cancers thrown in there, but what they're really studying is how cells work. All right. Thank you very much, everyone.